So we've heard a lot about alternative data today. Um, I'd like to kind of step back a little bit and, and go through kind of the evolution of alternative data through the years. Um, and just to start this off, uh, when I started kind of thinking about alternative data, I did, definitely didn't have a term as easy to say. Uh, I probably called it a bunch of different things back then, maybe non-traditional data or just data. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I basically came from an information science background. That's what I studied. Um, and you know, entered the finance industry and uh, frankly was kind of shocked uh, at the, uh, limit, the limited data that was being used in the, alter in the uh, uh, investment industry. Um, so I, when I started uh, using alternative data for the first time, um, it was uh, a new data source that nobody had really thought of using. Uh, emails was the um, source. And uh, what we were doing was um, gathering information from emails related to uh, receipts. So we were trying to figure out um, who was buying what uh, and you know, uh, figuring out um, what we thought was uh, going to be the um, earnings of companies like Amazon or Netflix. Um, and so that was kind of my beginning, but you know, alternative data goes back further than that. Um, you know, new unique data collection and analysis techniques are actually uh, emerging really every day now, and it's really a struggle to keep up. Uh, frankly, that's, that's why we created our insights platform, my, my company Amass Insights, uh, to keep track of all of these developments. Uh, and as everybody has said, we're still in the early innings uh, of this transformation. Um, so that being said, uh, I want to introduce my panel, panelists, Pavle, Michael, and Justin. Um, they uh, you know, have also been working with alternative data for, for years now. Um, and I'd like them to speak to kind of the changes they've seen over the years and you know, kind of developments that we expect going forward. Um, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Okay, uh, Pavle Sabic. So I um, work with S&P Global. So I'm a senior director heading up the professional services business here in New York. Um, so we service law firms, accountancies, consultancies, uh, big four audit and accounting and such alike. Um, I've been with these guys eight years. Uh, before this, I was in London for three years, and before that, I worked for State Street. I was a risk consultant with them, kind of covering Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Before that, I worked in a portfolio manager. Um, essentially, for these guys, I, I run the business in the P&L. I have a global team, and we focus on providing alternative and fundamental data to the market um, with a variety of different uh, platforms, data cells, uh, data, data sets, feeds and such alike. So um, I'm looking forward to talking about what we've been doing with clients and alternative data. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Michael Beal. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Data Capital Management. We're a machine learning hedge fund based about 10 blocks away from here. Um, we have a focus on alternative data and creating the machines that are doing the kind of machine learning and artificial intelligence I was spoken about on a previous panel. Uh, my background prior to that, I co-founded the Big Data Machine Learning Group for JP Morgan. Before that, I was a discretionary investor who in 2009 kind of envisioned that the work that I was doing as a human would be automated away and started to transition to that side of the world. I'll speak more about that, uh, I guess, on the next question. Hey, Justin Zen, one of the co-founders at ThinkNum. Uh, we provide alternative data from the web. So basically, every company is going online. Uh, selling products online, hiring people online, and we are building the central data index that uh, collects all this information and uh, work mostly with uh, hedge funds and banks into how they can generate insights from this information. Uh, prior to starting the company, I was a quant at a hedge fund called BOM, and prior to that, I was in school. <laughs> Great, thanks guys. So. Uh, the first thing I want to start with is kind of the past. So where, do, where have, you know, have you guys seen the developments in the alternative data landscape over the past five to ten years? Um, and what do you think is possible to do now that would have been unthinkable maybe five to ten years ago? And I, I'll give this question to Justin or Michael. Sure. So I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but the, what we do now would not have been possible uh, five or ten years ago. Um, you know, 10 years ago, the, uh, you know, uh, social media was starting, people were starting to use cell phones, um, and, you know, there just wasn't enough data to index, but essentially, 
you know, some of the greatest companies have been founded over the last 10 years. Companies like Uber that changed the way we, you know, get a car. Companies like uh, DoorDash that changed the way we get our food. So all of these companies are web companies. So that's the trend that we're really taking advantage of is commerce coming from offline to online. And, you know, that's why um, a lot of data is created during this transformation. And that's why we're able to index this data. But uh, nothing that we do now would have been possible five or 10 years ago. Yeah, on a high level, I'd say, yeah, most of this interesting stuff wasn't possible five, ten years ago. Uh, but I'd break it down probably along four categories or so. <clears throat> the first one is, you know, as a discretionary investor, we talked about, uh, what was it, the example, taking Tommy Hilfiger or somebody out to and getting them drunk and trying to figure out what happened. Uh, when I was trained, before any of these diligence meetings that we had with CEOs, we took pride as investors that the meeting was supposed to be informative to the CEO. We were teaching them something about their business uh, and then having them confirm or deny that. Um, but if we were just kind of coming with facts that he or she knew, that we weren't really doing our job. In order to do that, we would go out and speak to GLG. We would hire uh, BCG to do kind of uh, same store sales checks and stand outside of Walmart and picture how many people were going through, et cetera. And the real vision that I had in 2008-9 was like, there's no reason that humans should be doing this on a batch-based process. Uh, so I break it down along kind of four categories. Uh, the first one, as it comes to the public markets trading in particular, is more of a contextual understanding of price movements. You may say that the yield curve is uh, steepening, and that is some derivative uh, information about what the Federal Reserve is doing, but it's better, uh, I don't know if I thought I saw Evan on the... Um, uh, speaker lists, but it would be better to look at the natural language processing associated with all the different speeches and seeing what they're actually saying, not only on the main stage, but then also in like the Yale Club, etc. And so that's applications of NLP. Uh, second thing would be you see prices are moving, uh, but there's a difference between a two standard deviation move that's due to a credit rating downgrade versus an earnings uh, miss and having more of a contextual understanding so that you don't just say all two standard deviation movements are uh, created equal. So I put one in terms of the real-time streaming of contextual information, which has a pretty high reliance on natural language processing and streaming analytics. The second version is around uh, uh, channel checks uh, in terms of the sales channel. And uh, I think some of the things you guys were talking about, email receipts, that all goes towards that. The third thing is more towards inventory checks. I uh, saw some interesting analysis around Tesla and like the production levels that they're doing and being able to look at plants and firing, but more on production stuff. Then the third thing is more around like capital expenditures and having a better view around that. So each one of these things can be just seen as abstract pieces of data, but in reality is augmenting and automating the work that human investors traditionally have gone about doing, providing that in a real time or whatever the frequency of updates of that information is, making it automatic, and then forming some way for it to be consumable upstream by machines in our case, in Adam Braff's case, maybe it's in a manner that humans can digest it. Uh, but in all cases, it's just a representation of these diligence checks that very good investors were doing in a more manual batch-based manner that is the same information, but now a more robust, scalable, extensible, uh, repeatable process. I mean, let's, Let's add a bit of kind of facts and context to all of the kind of alternative data and the data that's out there, right? And this is the kind of thing that um, I was talking to my team about recently to try and conceptualize it. So in terms of one terabyte of memory back in 1985, you know, that would have cost as much as a jumbo jet, right? Just now, 2007, that costs as much as avocado and toast. Right, one gigahertz of processing power in '85 would have been the same. Too much. As Avocado toast costs way too much. It does actually. Me. That's true. Like <laughs> way too much, right? Um, processing power in '85 would have cost as much as building the Burj Khalifa, right? So absolutely unprecedented. Uh, now it's as much as getting a Starbucks coffee. Then you take in the last two years, we have created 90% of the data that's out there, right? And in the last 60 seconds, while we've been up here. Some other stats, right? In terms of Instagram, around about 46,000 pictures have been posted. On YouTube, four point something million videos have been watched. On Twitter, 400 something thousand tweets have been made. And so keeping up with that data, like scraping it, standardizing it, linking it, that's really what's really, what's really, really hard. And, and Michael, you, you said a really interesting point in, in terms of you know, earnings, for example. So 
what we've been doing is taking transcripts from earnings calls and putting that into the system and then using something that's called a, a gunning fog index. So uh, earnings and transcripts, so Seagate CEO in Q2 2017 um, was given an earnings call and what we did is we took this transcripts and used the gunning fog index which as I mentioned shows um, how, how much of an, how high education do you have to have to understand that dialogue. So um, the more complex the words, the higher education you have to have. And essentially what happened is that the CEO used really long complex words to describe an earnings call when, let's face it, if you're smashing it, you say 25% up on EBITDA, we're 50% higher on, on revenue, yada, yada. But he was talking about architecture and he was talking about all of these amazing existentialism and all this kind of nonsense. And what en ended up happening was that the, the stock price dropped 33% in a couple of months after that. So it's like using this sort of alternative data and linking it, tagging it into standard data like stock prices to, to basically utilize the explosion of data that we're getting right now. That's an interesting point, too, because uh, I, I think if you ask most investors, they wouldn't consider earnings calls, quote unquote, alternative data, um, because, you know, it's been used forever. But when you're looking at, uh, you know, uh, new data sources, you have to think about what you can gather out of that, uh, um, you know, data source. In this case, it's actually noise. You know, it's actually, uh, you know, speech, not noise. Uh, hopefully it's not noise. Um, and so I, I think that, that actually brings me to my next point. Um, I think that uh, you know about 20 years ago, maybe I don't know the exact date, but Starmine, you know, came out, um, and that was extremely innovative at the time, um, and I would argue it would be considered alternative data today. Nowadays, you know, that's more table stakes. So my question uh, to, the, to all the panelists is: Are there any data sets that um, you know are actually now table stakes in the alternative data industry, and maybe should be considered, uh, you know, actual financial market data? Or has that not happened yet? I mean, you can make the argument. I'll just throw one out. Like a payroll data, for example, that, that is out there. That's considered alternative data, but really it's been out there for a very, very long time. Um, for us, we, we acquired a company called Panjiva, which is supply chain data. And if you look at, it, look at it, it's probably the most prevalent data in the US since the US began because poor trade was how the US was constructed, right? So it's actually not alternative at all. It's actually pretty orthodox, if you like. Um, so that's just two before going on, going on too much other examples. Yeah, I'd say, you know, credit card data is something that people often point to as everybody's taking a look at it, news data. But my, my thing with all of these, and the thing I struggle with to say that any of these new data sources are really commoditized away, I guess is the other thing that people will point to, is there's a lot of advancements. Like this panel ties a lot to the previous panel, right? Like just take something like, I don't know, news. I think a lot of people have been incorporating news via a variety of vendors, but the analytics associated with natural language processing are increasing exponentially month over month. So I don't know, it depends on what version you're looking at it. You know, maybe everybody has uh, core to the same source underlying data, Dow Jones and some Twitter and some other things. But then how you actually go about applying the NLP towards that is very different and will lead to different answers. And I don't think anybody has really figured that out. Same thing when it comes to credit card data. Depending on how you're thinking about the panel, what's the representation, how you know, big of a coverage do you have, I think that that's still somewhat different. Um, but at its core, at least at DCM, we don't really think of any of these data sets as being uniquely valuable on their own. It's really all about how are you linking them and tying them and at what points and what inflection points are they v valuable versus not. Are you trying to create something that's a bellwether or are you trying to create something that has more of a conditional logic towards it? Uh, and so there's a lot, a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of thinking about how you go from this broad level of I have some data to I know how to use it and even more so I know how to use it and extract value for my type of strategy. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't say that there's really anything that's been commoditized away or that you would say in order to be an alternative data fund you have to have this type of data. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I, I second that. I think, you know, there's still a very important role for humans to play with, with how they analyze and interact with the data. So we're very far away from where it's just completely machine driven, you know, where 
we're probably centuries away. Um, and one thing, you know, it's kind of interesting to point out is we go to all the same conferences and we think everybody is using alternative data, but let me tell you, there's many, many people that have no idea what alternative data is. Um, so until the rest of the world, you know, uses alternative data like they do Bloomberg market data, you know, that's just uh, like when I've been close to, uh, to table stakes yet. But that actually leads me into my next question, which is for you, Justin. Um, you know, how far behind do you think the funds that are not currently using any of these either uh, new data sources or new analytical techniques are, and uh, do they stand a chance to catch up um, in, in the current environment? So I think the funds that don't know what alternative data is, um, you know, there's probably less hope for them, right? I mean, yeah, you know, like the, the, the media is talking about it. You know, there, there is obviously, um, obviously there's people who have different trading strategies, but I think, you know, at, at this point they should at least know of it. I think uh, the most interesting subsection are the funds that know about alternative data, but they're trying to figure out how to incorporate it. And I think you know those are the most interesting funds to, to talk about. And you know we and we talk to these uh, funds all the time. Do you build out a data science team? Do you hire coders who just you know like what is what does quantum mental mean? Um, I think uh, so. The, the people that are trying to figure it out have a great chance of catching up. Why? Because, you know, there's so many alternative data sets out there. It's easier, it's cheaper to test data now than ever. People are starting to understand that, you know, if you have a data set, then you need to tie it to a QSIB or an ISIN so the quants can at least test it really quickly. So I think, you know, I think it gets easier and cheaper to test, and I think that's why they can easily catch up. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say you have to break it down by investor type, right? So. For a universe, well, first statement. I think for those who have very long holding periods, and that's like core to their investment strategy and their investors are happy with that and what comes along with it, then I don't know, right? Um, at the end of the day, going back to my thesis, it's a machine readable version of things that humans were doing. So if you still have the research process to go about finding out all these different pieces of information, then whether you call it alternative data or you just call it diligence, I think that the line would be quite blurred, right? Whether you're getting the information via an automated process or you're still going out and talking to the ex-CEO of some industry to find out what are the leading trends and the likes. Like, if you get to that same information, I think that those people will be lower impacted. Um, the second thing, though, on people who are on more of a shorter-term horizon, I think that they will definitely struggle. Um, I think that the days of being able to have a very large cross-sectional arbitrage book have low win-loss ratios and try to employ lots of leverage to try to come towards that and say that when you lose, it's not your fault, it's because of regime change. I think that those excuses are coming to an end and the incorporation of these alternative data sets will enable systematic investors to push out their efficient frontiers of returns, risk-adjusted returns, win-loss ratios, et cetera. And for those who are doing something in a systematic manner and not incorporating these other insights, there are a lot of people who are, and the investors will have choice, and they're looking for it. So on, depending on which barbell of the uh, holding period game you live on and whether you're getting the information another way, I think maybe, maybe not. But on the second level, then you have to think about your investors. And every investor right now is so focused on kind of factor attribution, what's driving your returns, and should they pay for that. And to the extent that you're not incorporating some of these alternative data features which investors feel like they can't do and therefore are willing to pay a manager to do, and you can be very easily attributable to underlying factors, well, it may not necessarily be a returns thing, but unless your returns are totally differentiated from others, then you're going to get into why should I deal with you when I could replicate it or you're not very distinguishable from others. So again, I think that it's more those people who are trying to play in the lower duration, you know, sub a month period where, yeah, you really have to try to incorporate these things. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have some troubles as time moves on. Thanks, guys. So um, I wanted to ask uh, Pavle. Um, you, you know, your company made a few uh, acquisitions recently um, in the alternative data uh, space uh, with Kensho and Pancheva and, and SNL. Um, what particularly drew you guys to those, those companies? Um, and, and, you know, how did you kind of go through that due diligence? Uh, what kind of an analytics were you looking at? So, um, yeah, I won't spend a huge amount of time going through the companies um, in high detail, but what I will do is go through them in chronological order 
tell you why we made the uh, acquisition and then what came of it. Um, so the first one is SNL, so it's savings and loans, nothing to do with the, the comedy stand-up show, which would have been great. Um, but we actually divested away all of the magazines, all of the uh, McGraw-Hill Financial, um, and made our company very much technology-focused, uh, data and technology-focused. So with SNL, it complemented our broad data sets with very deep industry information for real estate, um, manufacturing, TMT, these kind of things. We also required around about 400 um, journalists as well to give us kind of, you know, news. Um, what we found with, with SNL data was that you had that level of depth when it came to, you know, metals and mining, let's say, right? So the, the level of data that we have for how many oil rigs are being opened and closed um, and all the industry-specific details was complementary to the broad set uh, that we already had with Capital IQ. The reason that we, we acquired Kenshaw after that was really to get AI, RPA, natural language generation at a foundational level. So, you know, when we're talking about alternative data and AI, we took that news and we asked AI to tag it. So one of the things we asked was uh, tornadoes, particularly recently they've been happening down in Florida and, you know, the southeast. Um, the first tagging that the AI came back with was that it was natural disaster. Okay, that's cool. The second thing that it came back with was it was mass human migration. And so what a lot of the companies that we work with and investment managers were able to do is take that different type of tagging and other mass migrations they may have not thought about and see how it's going to affect consumer-driven sentiment, let's say, um, in, that, in that industry. And then finally, we acquired Panjiva, which is 40% of the world's global supply chain. Um, it covers around about 9 million companies as well. With Panjiva, um, I'll give an example of GoPro. So we found that when we were analyzing the supply chain information for GoPro, um, that the supply of uh, products that was made in China was dwindling or it was decreasing. And what we did is we looked at this regression analysis afterwards and we saw that the, the share price had actually dropped and it was a leading indicator towards, you know, supply chain was mentioned in the previous, um, in the previous panel. So taking supply chain and taking that level of kind of foundational AI, RPA, um, and making sure that you have a holistic view of what a particular company will do, um, that's really why we acquired these companies and, you know, to made sure that we could kind of give that full breadth of coverage to clients. And um, uh, going along with that, so it's, it, you know, you guys obviously went through a process to figure out, you know, if the data was valuable, obviously if the company is valuable and, you know, how to value that. Um, I'd like to ask Michael, um, how do you, uh, what, what are the kind of the steps in your process for, you know, sourcing and, and integrating an alternative data set? Are there, you know, what are the biggest bottlenecks? What are the things that really kind of slow you guys down when you're, when you're kind of, uh, you're trying to integrate these things? So the biggest bottleneck for us has traditionally been um, focusing on the supplier. So some supplier comes in and talks about some cool data set. And then the problem is you don't know whether it's cool or whether it's valuable. Um, and then the question is, do you have the resource and the capacity at the time to distinguish between the two? And I'd say that happens all the time. You have really nice presentations and you're not quite sure around there. Uh, in the beginning, what we would do was, you know, kind of traditional, like, run a bunch of different machine learning algorithms on top of the data, see what's the information content. Uh, even you can do, like, simple regressions, but it can range anywhere from, like, a simple regression to a support vector to a neural net, it doesn't really matter, and try to see, like, is there at least some information content of that variable and the new data that's being presented. That'll get you, like, 60% of the way there. Um, <clears throat> to the extent that that's interesting, then you have to go into like more data quality stuff, uh, at least for us is the next step. Um, you know, if you say that there's a tanker in the world and that, or there's an oil rig and that it turned off at 11.33 a.m., like how do you know it really turned off at 11.33? Uh, that ends up being like a cross-validation across different data suppliers that have similar information and you're trying to see, at least for us, who has the highest veracity of the information. Um, and then if you have some viewpoint that there is some level of information content, that doesn't tell you whether you can create a strategy out of it, but if there's some level of mutual information content or some derivation of that theme and you have some level of veracity associated with the timestamps as to when it happened, which is important to putting it into real live trading, um, then you can go into like legal and strategy creation and the likes. Um, for us, we're a small team. Uh, we have 15 people and that's a core component of our vision. So the first year and a half, we did all these things I talked about, very one-off. 
Um, then we realize we're asking ourselves the exact same question and it's just a function of the answer is a function of the independent variables and how they relate. So we created a lot of different tool sets um, that are automated around there and our vision is to move to the point where we don't even really have to be involved. We can just tell data supplier X, upload your data and we'll get back to you. Um, and I think we're 25% of the way or 25% left to be able to get to that point. Um, then you get all to all the legal and negotiations around there. But at the first point, it's just, does it have some information content? And are the timestamps really true? If there's no answer to that, then you probably should just throw it away um, before you get into all this uh, cross-validation of different data sets. Um, I'm uh, not sure I, how you guys do it. But I do want to leave a little, bit, a little bit of time for questions afterwards. And also, I know everybody wants to get to the entertainment and the drinks. Uh, but I do want to ask one more question. Uh, and I can, I can, so we can start with Justin, but we can, we can uh, address everybody on this question. So historically, uh, at least from our view, alternative data really has been mainly utilized in researching equities and specifically um, in the consumer-centric com companies um, you know, using credit card data and, and the like, uh, things that touch consumers. Um, is this changing and, and what other sectors or asset classes are being affected by alternative data these days? So it's, a, it's definitely changing. Um, obviously consumer data, it's obvious, you know, there's just a more data, there's credit card data, there's more web data. Um, but, you know, there's use cases in industrials, right? Um, just like in investors used to track every single VIN number that, you know, of cars that are coming on and off like car dealer websites, you can do the same thing with Caterpillar plants, right? Um, as a predictor for their sales. Um, just today, I learned about a use case for, uh, for utilities. I'm not that anyone really cares about utilities, but you can actually see uh, how many customers they have by, by city every single day and how it's changing over time. Uh, healthcare is a really interesting industry. You know, there's always talk about Amazon becoming a healthcare company. So now you can, for the first time, track like you know drugs pricing online instead of looking at uh, traditional scripts data. Um, and that's just in equities. I mean, obviously, you know, there's use cases in fixed income. Uh, I think I think macro is really interesting. You know, how do you aggregate? Uh, equity data up into a sector view or, you know, um, uses to look at things like inflation, right? You can obviously build a price indexing in, in real time instead of waiting for the uh, government to tell you how, how wrong their inflation numbers are every month. Um, so I think, you know, I think uh, equity is consumers, the obviously the very first uh, places where there's just a lot of alternative data, but over the next year, really, um, every sector is going to have uh, their own use cases, and we're really excited about that. Yeah, my personal view is that there is data available for every problem to be solved. Um, every single company in the Fortune 500 and beyond has created some sort of a data science center, and they're all amassing information, whether it's proprietary, but more often than not, it's third party uh, related that they're using to solve their own individual problems. Now, in terms of the application of said information, so my first statement is that this data is a wash, it's everywhere, and it's really just, do you know how to pipe into it? Do you know how to tap into it or not? Do you have permissible data use rights or not? Then the second thing about the actual use of it, all this stuff, you know, we're a heavy machine learning firm. So everything for us is just about, can you define an objective function and can you have the definitions of that objective function success or failure be scalable and repeatable over time on a historic basis. And so that's easy in terms of price returns in liquid asset securities. It's harder in terms of bilateral, non-marketable securities, and I don't touch that. You guys can have fun with that. Um, it's also relatively practical, and pro um, yeah, practical in terms of now casting discrete variables. Uh, that come out on a weekly or a monthly basis, albeit you have a lot of other confluting, uh, confluencing factors that go into there. So I think that as long as it's a liquidly traded asset class, it certainly is applicable to that from equities to Bitcoin. Uh, and for now casting regular releases of information, that also gives you enough of a true north uh, to be able to see if you can have an objective function that you can train upon. And uh, the information's all there. It's just about being clear about how do you know whether it was useful or not. And some of these other more esoteric use cases come with way more human discretion as to whether it was true or false. And therefore, it's harder to go to that first step that I talked about, about the mutual information content contained within the data. Um, 
which just makes me think of, you know, like uh, Ben Bernanke's briefcase. You know, people are familiar with that whole alternative data analysis. So it's like, if his briefcase is, is filled to the brim, then he's going to make a case to interest rates are going to go up. Otherwise, he's just going to be like, no, it's cool, they're going to stay. Is it useful? Probably not. Is it alternative data? <sighs> Whatever. I, I'm not entirely sure if it is or not. So it really is, how do you take that data and how do you, how do you put that into value and into, into investment? So with law firms that, that I work with, for example, they will use ratings data to figure, figure out where they may, might get new clients, right? So that use case is, for them, alternative data. For, obviously, banks and other, uh, other players, not so much. So it's really what the purpose is and how you get the value out of that data. Yeah, and I, to, just to echo uh, all the panelists, um, I think if you can dream it up uh, in regards to data, it can be done. Whether it's currently being done is a different story. And if it's not, there's probably a lot more value there as long as you, know, you can tie it to a security or, or even a private company. So um, you know, I, I would encourage people to you know, think of you know, new ways that um, information or uh, devices like you know, cell phones can be used and um, you know, use that in your investment process. Um, all right, so I want to open it up to questions from the crowd. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, Michael, you mentioned two things that I'll characterize at a high level as basically throughput, right, or basically finding unique data pools where the signal to noise ratio is very, very high, um, and latency in this fundamental shift that we're seeing from this batch, process of it, batch processing of information to real-time decision making. For you today, which one of those is more important, and how do you see that changing over time as these strategies evolve? It's a great question. I think clearly it's, for me, it's the former, or the latter, rather. It's all about the latency aspect of it, but we have a high turnover portfolio, and I think that that's where machine learning also is most adept, is for shorter-term decision-making uh, processes, gives more of a response function. So from our perspective, I do believe that these things Hello? Okay. These things where it's more about um, longer term, like information and insights, but that a human could pick up for it if they, had the, they do have the time to do it. I personally believe that there's less real alpha there, um, but where I see it as being a real value opportunity is that quants traditionally are blind. We understand the what. We understand that a price movement occurred. We understand that... Uh, that value is in a momentum reversal. But we don't also understand the why, because our machines don't have that ability to pull in that information at the time of the decision. And when they do, they only can do it, and I even heard it here, at the time that a portfolio rebalancing is supposed to happen. Well, that's all good and well. But let's say you're sitting in October, and it was one of those days that markets just were crazy, which was basically every other day. And that's not the day that you had programmed for your thing to rebalance, right? But some new information came out, which is causing a drawdown within your portfolio. And now all your portfolio knows is the traditional statistical things to take into real time. But if they had had information about what was driving that, what was causing that, they would have been able to incorporate that into their decision-making function and make smarter risk-adjusted pred uh, predictions. If you have a traditional architecture, at least all the ones that I've seen, where it's all based upon pre-scheduled batch-based processing, well then a lot of these opportunities that humans just can't keep up with in reactive uh, component, you're actually not adding any real value. So to add on to that, it's why for, we started in 2015, but the first two years of our existence were just technology built, to be able to build a system that could deal with all this streaming data and not be focused on pre-scheduled batches, but all be based off of trigger response type um, trading strategies. So I think that for the quants in particular and for a lot of these new alternative data sets, being able to incorporate it at the time that you see a price movement, at the time that humans are being biased by what's going on and their fear, is October ever gonna end or is it gonna revert in excitement? That's the time when a more robust statistical less biased process adds the most value. But if you don't have a system that can do that on a, without having a human reschedule the optimization or put that uh, function, then I think you're missing out on a lot of the value that's there. 
Um, that's just my personal viewpoint, and that's what we built our business around. Do you think the why starts to, that contextual why starts to get commoditized over time as well, or, or maybe not? <clears throat> it depends, right? Like, it depends how you think about the world, right? Do you think about it as a signal? In which case, if it's just a signal, then yes, it's going to be commoditized away. Or do you think about it as truth, right? And here, let's play out a scenario of that. Let's say, I don't know, last week, towards the end of the week, or the week before that, Google does its announcements, its earnings, and the whole market sells off. And now you're sitting there and you're like, well, what do I do? All right, so if you're able to have either the technology that is enabling you to in real time see, okay, Google sold off, it's similar to a lot of the other announcements that took place in terms of trade war tensions, the impact of global growth. Well, now as it comes up to the next one, which is first, if you happen to have your pre-scheduled batch-based process be last Friday when Apple made their earnings, then maybe fine. You might be able to incorporate all these other learnings that happened about the trade war tensions, the rhetoric, and the impact to forecast growth. And maybe if just by chance you had your rebalancing be done on that Friday, then you may have been able to make smart choices as it came to Apple. But that's a lot of maybes versus if you have a real-time streaming system that's able to update its information, be able to learn that, hey, this theme about trade war is really starting to play itself out in earnings. I see it here, and therefore I'm making a decision without a human having to call an investment committee and say, I think we should change our batch process because of A, B, and C. That's really where I think it's going. So in that construct, then it's really, I don't know if you see that as a signal, or do you see that as just a truthful understanding? And if you do believe in some form of the efficient markets hypothesis, which says prices will react to changes in free cash flow, then I don't really know exactly how that can be commoditized away, unless you really want to argue for prices are going to have some discontinuous jump to their efficient value and never oscillate around that, um, that medium. I personally don't believe in that super strong form of the efficient markets hypothesis. Therefore, I do believe that it can't necessarily be commoditized away as we're teaching machines truth, particularly if you really understand machine learning and you understand all the different hyperparameters that go into it, you'll still end up with people coming to a pretty Gaussian distribution as to how they're coming up and interpreting different information. And there's no reason to think that machines won't still end up having that Gaussian information uh, or a Gaussian distribution as to how they're pulling in this truth. I'm not sure if that's helpful. No, yeah, super helpful. Thanks for the color. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to the panelists.